My guest today is Drew Brown. Drew, how are you, sir? Doing well. How are you? I'm doing great. Uh, tell me, what do you do? So I'm the, <laughs> professionally, I'm the Chief Information Officer for Union Bank and Trust. Um, for reference, UBT is based out of Lincoln, Nebraska. We cover the Lincoln, or I'm sorry, the Nebraska and Kansas City areas, so kind of Central America. Uh, for reference, we're about a $40 billion asset under management bank. Um, and yeah. Sounds like a fun job. Yep, it is. It's a lot of fun. And I met you in uh, my, on my first ever visit to Lincoln, Nebraska. You gave a keynote about what? About the changing relationship between employers and employees in the tech sector. Oh, well, let's talk about that. Are you changing relationship um, as a result of the changes in the world the last few years? Yeah, I think in part. I do think that a lot of what we've seen happen over the last few years is actually a natural result of directions we were going even before the pandemic. Um, but yeah, but the uh, the pandemic absolutely accelerated things, and I think I think in some ways it kind of put enough cracks in the dam that some trends that we had seen for a long time were finally able to really come to light. Oh, let's talk about some of those trends. Sure. So one of the things in my presentation that I talked about is the changing nature of work-life balance. Um, before you go, before we went into the pandemic, well, let me let me give just a little bit of context. Before we went into the pandemic, we had really healthy unemployment. We had a really healthy economy. Um, housing affordability was still becoming problematic. Yeah. Wasn't he healthy unemployment sounds like a strange term. Yeah, yeah, that's that's the economics classes that I took in college. Um, there, there's actually a healthy level of unemployment. Zero is impossible, but but yeah. So you had all of this good times going and you had you know you i mean for years we read articles about millennials and getting into gen z and desires to change kind of change their values and how they interacted with their employers um and at the same time i think you saw a lot of kind of legacy behaviors and attitudes getting handed down um and so when COVID hit and suddenly we all got pushed you know out of the offices and into our homes right. at first we i mean at first we were so just trying to get through COVID, right trying to figure out how to manage all that but once we kind of got our bearings back again, you know, you, you quickly saw a lot of people across age groups, across industries starting to say, man, is, is this is this what I want? Um, so, for example, you know, I've I'm, I'm an ex consultant. I have a number of friends in professional services. Me too. Um, yeah. Yeah. Both consulting and law. And, you know, several friends of mine who are partners in different firms were saying, oh, my gosh, we're losing junior staff left, right and center um, because so many of them were saying, wow, I'm I'm spending, you know, some of the some of the most fun years of my life, you know, however you want to call it, but some of the best years of my life, um, just just working. And they would sit in their condos, they would sit in their apartments, their houses, and they look outside and they'd say, my gosh, this isn't this isn't what I want for myself. And just in droves, they were leaving and they were looking for opportunities that really fit more their their personal values. Um, and so I think you saw more sort of employee power in terms of the employees had more power and leverage to pursue what they wanted. Versus employer power, where at least in those firms, for sure, there were their uh, their professional relationship was focused more on the needs of the employer. I see. So the balance of power has shifted um, and now. When there's so many job openings, so many employers are are searching for someone to fill these roles. Partly because, well, there's a lot of reasons why. I mean, but partly it's because of what you described that there that uh, just people are being more picky about the jobs. That they yeah, want. absolutely, absolutely. And when you think about it, something that's so interesting to me about this whole episode is there's no, I'm not aware of any central organized labor movement, right? I'm not aware of any agency. I'm not aware of any, any union. I'm, I'm not really aware of any, anybody. In the, in the IT industry, you mean? In the IT, yeah. Thank you, thank you. In the, and I, yeah, when I, I'm speaking, I appreciate that. I'm talking just technology. Um, I'm not aware of anybody on any scale who's organizing any of this. Right. Um, there's there's pockets for sure, but I mean, it, this is so broad, this is so big, and this is such a groundswell. And I'm not aware of anything in the history of at least my lifetime and anybody I know's lifetime in, in kind of modern labor where you've seen such a, a mass, unified, and yet completely grassroots effort to change, in some ways, the nature of work. Hmm. Um, so just the fact that people are demanding better work life balance, better better job. That's not enough. It's, it actually is changing, you think? And is it changing permanently? I think it is changing. I, whether it changes permanently, I think, is is a little bit... Uh, I, I think... 
I think the answer is kind of it depends. I think the jury's a little bit out. I hope it does. I think it's actually a lot healthier, both for the economy and for and for society. Um, I think what you're starting to see now is a lot of companies saying, OK, you know, we kind of have to seed ground on this one. Um, and so instead of saying we're not going to do work from home um, or we're going to drag people back into the office, I mean, it still just amazes me that Apple of all companies cracked on bringing people back into the office when you think about that. Right. So I mean, that's the kind of examples you look at. Right. I think I think you see more companies saying, OK, how can how can we capitalize on this? How can we engage with this? Um, and and I do. I mean, I absolutely believe the vast majority of companies would have loved to bring everyone back into the office and the logistics were just not there. COVID was still there. It took too long. There's so much resistance from employer employees, excuse me, that it's just not happening in any scale. Uh, well, I should say it's, it's happening, but not as much as they want. And, and what happens in the meantime is work from home is a managerial skill set. Um, I believe very strongly that over the next couple of years, you're going to start seeing MBA programs having sections in their HR classes where they're teaching work from home skills because they're going to say this is an important skill set you're going to need going into the workspace for a lot of you. Mm, um, interesting. And so I do think that we've had enough time for this to kind of burn in and for organizations to learn you know, just like all kinds of management trends, right? Just like center of excellent models, just like Six Sigma, just like, you know, all, whatever, you know, whatever new thing came in. This one kind of was forced in more than educated in, but I think we've had enough time for companies to let it kind of burn in that they're becoming more accepting of it now. Um, what's so, you know, another really interesting thing about it is you look at the data, especially during the pandemic after we burned in, you know, 21, that 2021 kind of era, and you had a lot of employees and even there was a price waterhouse study they did showed even more employers than employees thought it was working um mm. they're being productive you know they're hitting profit number i mean margins were expanding across the board but that's for reasons other than work from home um and so we've we've kind of figured this out i do think you'll still have company different companies are different right just like take any trend take six sigma some companies adopted some companies didn't um i do think that work from home you'll see something like that but again talking tech sector I mean, it's it's such a it's such a desirable trade. It's such or such a desirable uh, benefit, if you want to call it that. And there's really very little about the nature of tech work anywhere that necessitates being in an office. And so, in a very picky labor market, I think you have even more um, pickiness among your more talented folks to get work from home. Yeah, um, they have more. They have more leverage for sure. More leverage, right? And so then the question, you know, the question becomes, I don't know the answer, I guess we'll see, is the next time we hit any kind of sizable recession, which potentially is looming, um, what do we do with that? Do we bring people back into the offices? You know, I or do companies recalibrate so much that they just accept it? And one, one example of how that might play out is, you know, I used to work for a company years ago that we had oh, over 700 professional services, it was a consulting group, so over 700 professional services staff full-time and no physical office space and had never had a physical office. Um, that company is now over 20 years old, has still never owned an office. Hmm. And and that's and that's including 0809, right? And so they weathered it well um, without a whole lot of physical interaction. And I think that you'll see more companies say, hey, I, we don't need office space, right? We can save a lot of money on this, for example. And so they'll start to, to recalibrate towards an environment where hybrid work is the norm. And though, we, and so, you know, you'll have enough kind of capital level commitments, for example, that even when you go into a recession, I mean, what are you going to do? Go buy a building and put all these people in it, right? Like, I think, I think it's going to be something that people just get used to and can't really structurally get away from quickly. That's interesting because you're coming at it, to, you're a CIO, so you're, you're, you're the boss, you're the one that's employing people. Yeah. Um, and you're advocating for it. It sounds like uh, I, because there are advantages for the comp for the employers, even, yeah. even though it's being driven by the employees, as we said about earlier. It is. Uh, that's correct. And yeah, I'll I'll say that I'll say that very publicly. I do advocate for it. I think it's healthy. Um, I think it's good for people. I think that you know when you look at data, and and I'm going off my anecdotal conversations too. I, what I but what I mean what I hear is the same thing as I, the data I read. Not a lot of people want full time work from home as a percentage, probably 20, 25 percent. Um, when I say not a lot, and that's not a fair statement, that's about you know, so up to a quarter of people. So it's quite a bit. Um, but but, minority. Yeah, but it's a minority, you know, closer to 10 percent want to be in the office full time. And and then the, the remaining what is that 65 percent want to be hybrid. Um, 
and and that makes sense. I mean, a lot of, you know, we like interaction. No, you know, most of us don't want to sit, you know, alone in our basements or our offices or whatever. Um, and so I, I do still think that 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 providing a space and a way for folks to interact um, is definitely helpful for the organization. If I think just business side perspective, um, but I think it's also just very healthy for the individuals. You know, another thing that's that's a big trend alongside work from home, or not a big trend, a big theme driving work from home is flexibility. And when we talk about flexibility, the stories that get the best press headlines are the ones of someone buys an RV. And I had a friend who did this. He married two kids in April of 2020. He and his wife bought an RV. He he was very prescient, saw what was going to happen, and they they toured America for a year while he worked remote. That's a great story. Uh, my friend Jay did exactly the same thing. Two did kids. He? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. The same guy we're talking about. <laughs> yeah. My <laughs> And I mean, it, it, it's great experience, right? I mean, what a wonderful experience. That makes a great headline. That's a great soundbite that, you know, Wall Street Journal loves something like that. When you look at the data, um, what's far and away people are talking about, care more about when they say flexibility is really childcare. Um, mm-hmm. You know, I look a lot across organizations and talk to CIOs. You know, I know when we talk about organizations and we talk about the number of people who are single family or i'm sorry single parent or the number of people who are who are two working parent right um or even i mean even a lot of people who you know one spouse works full-time outside of the home one spouse is full-time in the home raising children it's still just incredibly beneficial for them to just build flex like that um and uh, child care costs are crazy i mean you're talking you know it's you've been around here lincoln nebraska 12 1500 dollars a week um yeah. it's sometimes pay. hard to find it's very, it's a great point. It's very, it can be very hard to find. And so, I mean, you're talking, gosh, even if you're a tech employee making decent money and you're, you're talking, you know, the numbers on that work out to 70 some thousand a year, plus or minus huge numbers. Uh, yeah. A lot of people will just say, I'm not going to work. I mean, that's an incentive. That's a disincentive yeah. to work. Yep. If you're only, if you're paying $70,000 and you're only making a hundred thousand dollars, I mean, the math, that just doesn't, doesn't work matter. out. Yeah, that's that's our that's our family. My wife um, and I don't, uh, don't want to get on teaching as a topic. So my wife went to school to become a teacher. Um, she's qualified, you know, being our teacher. And yeah, we ran the numbers and we thought, oh my gosh, we will lose money hand over fist if she goes into teaching. Um, and it's just you know, aside from any commentary on kind of the sad state of the implications of that, but it, there's just. There's so many incentives for people to have the flexibility to work from home more often. And when you look at the business productivity side, the numbers aren't bad. Like the numbers, a lot of the times don't go down. I know for us, they went up, like demonstrably went up. Hmm. Well, you don't have those huge traffic jams they have in like the Bay Area, San Francisco, for example, that people are losing two and a half hours of their day just right. driving back and forth to work. <laughs> Yep. Yeah. Here in Lincoln, it's not bad. You know, even at the worst, my commute was probably 10 minutes. Um, yeah. I used, I used still... to live in, yeah, I used to live in Seattle. I used to live in Southern California. You know, yeah. I mean, you're not, you're not dealing with that. And it's wild. I was in San Francisco for a conference six weeks ago. And I mean, the traffic was just, I was amazed. I, I had part of a day off. I was walking around in the middle of the day and there's just nothing because all these people in their homes. Yeah. Same thing in Chicago. Big last year. It was, it was spooky. <laughs> yeah. <deal> was. <laughs> Uh, we talked a lot about working from home, but there's other things that are changing as, as the world has changed over the last couple of years. What, what else has changed in the workplace? Sure, for sure. So um, I think that, so I think work from home has impacted a lot of it. I think that, you know, pay continues to be an issue. Um, if you look at the broader macro economy, um, inflation is a big deal right now. Obviously, that's, you know, that's been a thing. Um, and... <clears throat> I mean, the the pay raises in 2021 that you saw uh, people all over making, we're talking tech here, especially in tech. Um, that's a that's been a really big impactor in folks behavior. And so if you have super, super constrained demand, right, the old supply demand curve, I've got super constrained supply, excuse me, not demand, super constrained supply, super high demand prices go up. And that's what's happened uh, in tech labor. And even you know, as of right now, uh, late July 2022, and you know, maybe people will watch this in a month, and maybe what I say won't matter anymore because things have changed. <laughs> you know, things are moving here, but I mean, even still, uh, tech unemployment is still really low, and it's not as crazy and halcyon as it was six months ago. Um, but I mean, we're talking, we're still talking 2021 numbers here. We're not talking, you know, 2008. We're not talking, you know, deep recessionary numbers at all. 
And so <clears throat> you have a lot more leverage on the employee side. Um, and so I think a lot of organizations, I know, again, CIOs I talk to, I'm hearing more conversations around how do we meet employee needs? Um, and and sometimes that's, you know, sometimes that's money, but sometimes that's other things, that's flexibility too. Um, but I think I think that's a big conversation out there right now as well. I think it will persist being one. You know, even, even when you look at um, the unemployment numbers, when we went through that big dip, right, in 2020 when the pandemic hit, you know, everybody, everybody's seen some version of that chart where it just plummets, then it shoots right back up. If you look at that broken out by tech, it's it's almost a perfectly flat line. Like there's like almost no impact on employment in the tech space. It's a good time and, to be in this field. Yeah, and so it is. I think even if you think even if we do go into a recession, um, I don't know. I just don't personally. And again, we could watch this in a month, and I could be wrong. I, <laughs> I I don't I don't see I don't see the dynamics conspiring to really hit tech employment levels too bad. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, tech. I'll, like the pandemic drove a lot of things that tech it had a lot of challenges that tech could solve. Yeah. So, so for example, this uh, we recorded this over Teams. Uh, teams revenue went way up <laughs> because yeah. of the pandemic, because everyone was working remotely and not in the office anymore. Uh, yeah. And so, uh, companies like Microsoft and Google and the, even the IT department of your bank um, benefited from yeah. this challenge. So, absolutely. Uh, uh, is there are there things that are going to be worse? because of, uh, even after the pandemic is over? Um, so I'm, I'm an eternal optimist, so I, I, I'm sure the answer is yes. Um, <laughs> okay. But, but I, I, I mean... I'm an optimist myself. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think one of the things that is a challenge that, and I mentioned working for a company prior that had been a full-time remote, one of the things that they struggled with um, and that we've struggled with through the pandemic, and I think... I think is something, I think we'll figure it out, but I don't think it's going to come as easily is um, upskilling or not upskilling, training and integrating junior staff. So fresh college grads, you know, those sorts of, of folks. Um, that's been a real challenge for us. Uh, because currently, you can't see them face to face. You can't see them face to face. You know, in, in, in my old firm, um, we, lo we would lose quite a few people because we'd hire them. We'd say, we're so glad you're here. We're so excited. You're so smart. I'll go sit in your apartment and in a consulting space, I'll go sit in your apartment and in two months when we've got an engagement for you, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll call you up. And I mean, that's, I'm, I'm being a little facetious. We were much more involved in that. But yeah, I mean, young people want to generally, you know, the kind of people going to tech have, have ambition to learn and they want to grow. They want to grow their careers. They want to grow their skills. They want to work on cool things. Um, and, and there's, there is absolutely something to be said, especially at that level for being around people and just being around smart, experienced people who can look at your work, who can provide feedback, who you can overhear conversations. And it's it's a very insecure time in a professional's life. I mean, you just need that, you need that um, that network, that socialization, that fellowship. And and no doubt it's harder to form um, remotely than it is when you're all in person in, in a healthy culture, of course. And so, whereas I think your more experienced professionals um, kind of know the game, know folks, know how to integrate, you know, can get there. Um, your junior staff are still learning those skills, and I don't see that problem ever going away. I think I think that's going to be one of those big skills that we're going to have to continue to learn as managers um, and even as other staff. And how do we socialize and fellowship those people? Yeah, and I think uh, I mean you, you mentioned the the training, which most people think of as the technical skills, but the, you also mentioned the culture, and that's part of it. A lot of companies are very deliberate in the kind of culture that they build, or maybe they're not. Maybe it's organic, but they have a very strong culture, and it's hard to uh communicate that to new employees yep. and build yep. build that connection to the company yep. uh if you're not seeing each other face to face and yep. uh, and because of that uh, that just accelerates the turnover i think it's uh, why why should I, I i might stick around here because i just really enjoy like i the company i work for um it has a strong culture about peer help people helping each other mm -hmm. uh Smart, uh, calling up a smart person, asking a dumb question, and not getting looked down upon for that, which sounds like a, everybody should do that. But I can tell you, <laughs> after decades, not every company has that culture. Yep. Uh, and that's part of the reason I stay here. You know, there is, I could make more money somewhere else, but I just really, really enjoy that. Um, yep. And and it's less strong now. I remember that. <laughs> so I I interned at Microsoft um, oh. years ago, and I 
it was a six month kind of co-op internship. And I remember that I was a, you know, I was a dumb intern and <laughs> everybody's um, dumb about something. And <laughs> was it, was it, it was like, I'm going to try to remember the name. I think it was Mark Rasanovich is his name. He wrote some of the, he wrote he's some a pretty movies. smart guy. <laughs> he's a smart guy. And he answered my email. Oh uh, my gosh. Like, oh my gosh. Like I'm asking, you know, I'm asking Mark, you know, some technical question about some tool he wrote and he's like, oh yeah, you know, and nice about it. And wow, <laughs> just, you know, and that's, and then this is years ago. And so I was in a building with these people too. That's amazing. Um, the culture is, I can't sit, I don't know how many, you know, CIO committees, phone calls, whatever, you know, you get on, you know, you always get in peer network groups kind of thing. And, and conferences and culture. I never sit in one of these where we talk about work from home where culture doesn't come up quickly. Um, And rightly, right? I mean, rightly so. Like, it's incredibly important and it's hard to build. It's, you know, you can lose it quickly if you're not careful and it's valuable and it's it's valuable for everybody. I mean, it's valuable for the employer. Obviously, it's valuable for the employees. Like you said, you know, people want to come to a place where they have an environment conducive to what they value. And and you try to build this culture that that has a shared set of healthy values, and and no doubt through the pandemic, many of us just kind of rode on the culture we had already established. Um, and you know, fortunately, you know, having a strong culture, you can kind of get through a bumpy time like that. Um, but excuse me, it is something that has to be deliberately maintained, even even if you do go to the hybrid environment. And I know that, you know, some of the companies, I know GitLab, for example, is another one. There's others out there. Full-time remote, always have been, people all over the world. Um, and they, you know, when you read their employee handbook, it's it's online, it's free to go look at. Extremely deliberate in how they, they manage that culture. And so whether, you know, whether you advocate for something, whatever flexibility means to your employees, which I think is a big crux of, of what people ask for. You made a comment, David, when we were preparing for this, you know, someone you know, retired because he wanted more life work balance and yeah he deliberately said it that way (laughs) i'm gonna take that i'm gonna take that because i mean i think you just have so from what i've you know people i talk to you have so many years and so many people just saying man like i kind of like a little more life in my life work balance um but you know the, the the company matters and so i think you can i think i think you can absolutely create I think you can. I think you can have it all in a way. I think you can have more flexibility and a healthy culture, as long as you're deliberate about it. Anyway, I agree. I don't want to ramble. Uh, well, you're not rambling. This is very interesting. <laughs> is there anything we haven't talked about that we should have? Um, I think that this is maybe a bit of a sidebar. I got a couple of thoughts I'll share. Yeah. One for for more junior people who may be watching this. Um. Heck of a time to get in tech, you know, one of the easiest times to get a job in tech, maybe ever. Um, you know, I, I won't lie. Everyone I know who's young, who's interested in tech, I'm trying to mentor on my 13 year old son and my two teenage nephews are all doing a Python book with me right now. And I'm teaching them free. And, and I mean, the cool. message is like, literally, if you get through this book, this one book, and it's, you know, it's an intro to Python book, if you do this one book. And you do the problems and you learn it and you understand it. I guarantee you when you go off to college, some tech group or somebody somewhere is going to hire you and they're going to you know, help you pay through college. I mean, that's that's amazing. Right. Um, and so I think that I think that for for staff who are new in career, something I think you've seen more people. I know I've seen it for sure who are kind of coming in because the money's easier. Right. I mean, comparatively. Um, and so I would just re- remind people it's a career. Um, there's always ups, there's always down. There will eventually be a winter soon, you know, somewhere sure. along the way, things will get rough. Don't rest on your laurels. Um, you know, stay committed, stay invested. Um, I think another point that I would call out that's been really interesting to me thinking about um, how we're managing deciding the future of work is I think that. Um, I think that employers and, and really, I mean, management teams would do well to consult more with folks at various levels. And and when I say this, so I, I had this realization, I don't know, some, somewhere back there when I was thinking about kind of how I'm seeing employment change. And the realization was that there's kind of this survivorship bias thing going on where the people who are in senior leadership who are making decisions around, you know, how are we going to return to work or what's the future of work at our company look like? 
are people who, if you look at it through a purely Darwinian lens, they were the survivors. They were the thrivers. They were the ones who were, you know, in theory, the most optimally suited for the environment they were in, rose through the ranks, right? That sort of thing. And so now that group is being posed the question, so do we try something new or do we go back to that environment? Um, and I think I think even unconsciously, it's very tempting to see the value of the old environment when the old environment worked well for, worked well for you. Yeah. Um, but I know folks who've worked in other environments too, and there's a lot of people who can succeed very well in other arrangements too. And so I think there's, you know, one way you can mitigate that is to have kind of panels at different level of the organization, junior and mid, who advise put input in that as well. Um, you know, I've sought in my organization, I've, I've sought input from my folks at all levels and kind of how do we, how do we manage this? What do we want? What do we value? How do we keep our culture and values together? Um, I think this is something where most organizations don't have people at any level who have a lot of experience dealing with this situation. And right. so I think there's a lot of virtue to be found in consulting with people at all levels because I think you can figure it out together. Yeah, I think that's good advice whether or not we're going through this period of <laughs> change in the world uh, sure. is just sure. seek new perspectives uh, from uh, people that have different backgrounds and different levels of experience. Yep. Well, Drew, it's been a pleasure talking with you. I really appreciate you taking time this morning. Thank you, David. I appreciate it as well. And you stay safe. Yep. Technology education is a fantastic way to make new friends.